It takes half, half a second. All right. I believe we are live now. Welcome, everybody, to this, the fifth Urban Sensor Hacks Hangout. I'm Ken Demid, Editorial Director for Make. I'm, uh, I'm filling in for Mike Sinise this week. He had an engagement he had to go to. But I'm happy to be here. And we've got a really exciting hangout today with some people that are doing some very exciting things in the realm of environmental sensing. Uh, the, uh, the, the descriptor, as it were, for this week is we are featuring some master makers. Tim Dye, Michael Heimbeder, Ian Hang, and Raymond Yap. They are also collectively known as the air casting crew. And they are going to guide us step by step through the process for building an air quality monitor and discuss the challenges of achieving accurate measurements. Um, they're going to detail their work with grassroots groups and schools uh, to conduct environmental monitoring and advance STEM STEAM education. Um, I want to take a second, though, to, to thank everybody who has watched uh, our, uh, our these Hangouts so far, both live. We've been seeing upwards to 40 and above uh, live viewers for each of our uh, Hangouts so far, which is actually pretty darn astonishing. We're so happy about that. Even better, the follow-on viewing has been tremendous, ranging anywhere from about 2,000 up to 5,000 follow-on views of these Hangouts since they've posted. So we are really excited that this whole experience is getting out to people, is interesting and exciting to people, and hopefully is going to generate a lot more uh, discussion and action in the greater make community. And uh, speaking of the communities, what's really, we're seeing a lot of action over on the Urban Sensor Hack community right now. Uh, if you have not checked in there yet, you really need to, or if you haven't been there recently, uh, it's pretty astounding. We're starting to see a lot of the the, uh, uh, the groups and teams that received the Urban Sensor Hacks kits starting to show off the projects that they're building themselves, uh, share them around the community, get commentary, get uh, tips and suggestions. If you're at all interested in this uh, urban sensing concept and community, uh, the action over there is really hot right now. So it's fantastic. Check it out. Um, and so without further ado, I think it's time for me to uh, hand it off to our sort of uh, MC, our, our master master maker, Mr. Stuart Gaines, who's going to take us a little more in-depth into the uh, rather awesome team of master makers who, uh, who are going to uh, show off some nifty stuff for us today. So Stuart, take it away. Thanks so much, Ken. And let me echo the, uh, uh, the recommendation to look at the community page. It's just filled with... <laughs> Projects that uh, have gotten started uh, since we got going with the with the sensor hack, and people are showing what they're doing and also asking for advice. So if you know something, you might be able to step in and help someone. Uh, I'm just going to do a very quick background uh, uh, setting stage uh, for the uh, air quality session that we're about to have, and uh, I'm going to share my desktop right now, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is our urban sensor hack, and it's on air quality. And uh, I think that by the time we're done, we're also going to discover a lot of quality in measuring that uh, the experts uh, here today are going to help us with. But just for a little background, um, I, I did some research on, you know, what are we talking about here? And it's interesting. There's uh, a lot of people classify the air quality into... Uh, the, air, the things that hurt air quality into primary air pollutants and secondary air pollutants. Now, the primary ones are the ones that are actually emitted into the air, and the secondary ones are one are the the byproduct of the primary ones interacting with each other and sunlight to produce new and harmful co compounds. And what's interesting to me about about the uh, air quality measuring is that historically these uh, these systems have been quite large, stationary, and cumbersome. Uh, this is a, a typical monitoring station in Oregon uh, from the Oregon Department of Air Quality. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is what it looks like inside of some of these uh, systems. And uh, it was interesting to me to note that uh, in the province of Ontario in Canada, uh, which many of you know is you know, about the size of Texas, there are a total of only 40 air quality measuring stations in the whole province. So these things are big and heavy and stationary and expensive and uh, there are very few of them. So what's the future? Um, 
This is uh, the beginnings of what we're starting to see. This is a uh, something called the Aeroflex, and it's uh, coming out of Belgium. And it's really an effort by a university lab to sort of take what take what's important and turn it, make it mobile. But I think what we're seeing here through Make is uh, a lot more than that. Uh, this is a DIY uh, air quality monitoring uh, uh, solution that I saw recently on the Adafruit blog, and it really is based on Arduino and shows you how compact and how mobile these things are getting. Also shows you a little bit about the cases that are being used to contain them so that they become mobile. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael, who's going to talk about some of the uh, other issues of air quality measuring. Michael? Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so I was going to kind of go back and give you uh, some idea of where we started with air casting. So uh, for those who don't know, my name is Michael Heimbinder, and I'm the founder and executive director of a Brooklyn-based environmental health justice nonprofit called Habitat Map. And the primary thing we do is we work with schools and community-based organizations to create planning and advocacy maps. And we do that using habitatmap.org, which is our community mapping platform focused on qualitative information, meaning text, photos, and videos uploaded to map markers. Those map markers are editable, so it's a wiki map. And then they're aggregated, aggregated into thematic maps like green roofs or uh, basically anything that's focused on community health and quality of life is something that's suitable for Habitat Map. And that we started in 2007, and about two years ago, uh, we launched Aircasting. And Aircasting is a platform consisting of an Android app that's free from Google Play and a website for recording, mapping, and sharing health and environmental data. Um, and so when we first launched, uh, we wanted to do a couple things. One, not deal with external hardware, uh, which meant we used the phone microphone to measure sound levels. And two, we wanted to measure sound levels because it's the number one complaint to the city, to the New York City complaint hotline, 311. Uh, throughout all hours of the day, people are complaining about noisy neighbors, noisy planes, et cetera. Uh, so we knew that we would be relevant if we started with noise and also kind of uh, not have to deal with the complications that deal with external hardware connected to an Android phone over Bluetooth. Um, so we started with that. I'm going to just show you some uh, quick screenshots of the... Uh, app. We'll see how that works. I don't know how well that's going to work. Uh, we'll quit that. Uh, but at any rate, so you can go to Google Play and check out the app. I would definitely encourage you because the uh, unit that you'll be building with Ian and Raymond, um, that's how it connects. That's how it can display everything. Um, so first we started with sound levels. And then several months later, we started working with Ian and Raymond uh, on this unit. We call it the Air Casting Air Monitor. Um, and this, there's a do-it-yourself instruction manual on, uh, at, if you go to aircasting.org, uh, you go there and you'll be able to download a step-by-step -step instruction manual uh, detailing exactly how to build this unit. Uh, use an Arduino, uh, a, a lithium-ion battery. Uh, you can see the Bluetooth module here. Uh, it's got a, a CO sensor that's a, a Figaro TGS2442. It's got a, a, a E2V, which is now SGX, uh, Mix 2710 Nitrogen Dioxide Sensor, and then it's got uh, Honeywell Humidity Sensor, and uh, kind of, uh, I'm not even sure who makes the temperature sensor. Very cheap, a dollar for the temperature sensor. Um, and so we wired this up, and then got it talking to the, to the Android app, the Aircasting app, uh, over Bluetooth, so it communicates over serial, uh, and basically sends a measurement every second, and so it'll give you your CO, your NO2, your temperature, and humidity. Uh, so this was our first unit, and these are metal oxide sensors. Uh, there's a lot of complicating factors uh, in terms of getting useful and accurate measure, me measurements from metal oxide sensors. Uh, we ended up building a, uh, a performance lab, a low-cost performance lab that cost us around four or $5,000 so that we could try to evaluate some of the sensors on board this original unit. And what we found, uh, short, long story short, was that the carbon monoxide monitor uh, sensor was completely inappropriate for ambient air quality monitoring. And that's because it would saturate, and then it wouldn't come back down. So as we raised the concentration, we'd climb very slowly, which isn't really appropriate for mobile air quality monitoring. And then as we reduced the concentration, it would stay stuck. And the, probably the reason for that is that it was designed for industrial and occupational settings. So you can imagine an alarm goes off, it rises, the alarm goes off. It's not too much concern if it takes 24 hours for it to go back down again. It's already served its function. The NO2 sensor actually turns out to be quite good. It can detect in the low uh, part per billion range, which is what you would need for ambient air quality monitoring. But things like temperature and humidity impact the readings from the sensor. 
making it very difficult to take accurate measurements without having some sort of system in place to basically compensate for those factors. Um, then, uh, a few months later, uh, we built this unit, which is uh, something very similar to what you'll be building. This is an a, 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 a optical particle counter. Uh, and uh, you can find out more about this particular unit uh, and, and, and if you miss anything that Raymond and EM show you, if you go to takingspace.org, that's takingspace.org, we've got more information about the performance of this sensor versus other sensors that we've been testing, as well as an illustrated step-by-step -step guide. So if you miss anything, you go to takingspace.org and, and download the guide. It has the schematics, it has the step-by-step, -step, and it has the code that you're going to need uh, to communicate between the air casting unit and the app. Uh, so this unit worked out pretty well. It can count larger particles, uh, but the problem with this unit, one of the major drawbacks is that it's uh, light sensitive. It's an optical device, meaning that when stray light gets inside, it thinks it's seeing particles when in fact it's just seeing sunlight or lamp light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so one of the challenges I'll be showing you, we developed an, an enclosure for this to try to address some of those issues. Um, next, we teamed up with uh, Carnegie Mellon's Create Lab, and we did this. This is called the Ergo, um, and this was put together by Mike Taylor and Joshua Shapiro at CMU Create Lab. Um, and it's got a CO sensor on board, too, but it's a $90 sensor, as opposed to the previous one I showed you, which was $16. And it takes really great measurements. Also, again, temperature and humidity dependent, so you need to compensate for those in order to get accurate part per billion or part per million uh, concentration. Uh, but really quick response time, really good lower detection limit. Uh, it also has uh, an optical particle counter in it also. The one I showed you previously uh, is a Shinyi PPD42NS, and this one has something that's kind of like, uh, uh, and this was created by a Japanese company, and this was created by the Samyang DSM501A, and that's another optical particle counter, which is kind of a knockoff of the Shinyi created by a Korean company. Uh, we again had problems with light interference. Even though we tried to engineer an enclosure that would eliminate light interference, it was still getting in around these portals, which is where the CO sensor is, and around over here where the fan is, the exhaust fan. Um, this also has a, a temperature and humidity sensor in it so that we can run those compensations. Uh, and so, uh, and then I'll skip to the next unit. Uh, so we create our own instruments, but another way to get data into the system is to take an existing instrument, such as this. This is commercially available. It's uh, Dylos. Uh, Corporation makes this. And it costs uh, anywhere between two and four hundred dollars. And what EM and Raymond did is they basically took it from the serial port and sent it into an Arduino. And then we parse the code, uh, reformat it, and then we basically uh, shoot it out with a uh, Bluetooth to the app. Uh, so the great thing about air casting is everything is open source from our hardware to our software, and we have an API, an application programming interface, that basically allows you to very easily take an existing instrument, if you can pull the data out of it, if it has some sort of serial port or something, or create your own instrument and send the data to the app. Uh, one of the primary things we were trying to address in creating the app is we saw so many people developing really neat instruments, <coughs> but they weren't focusing as much on the software as they were the hardware. And so we said, why don't we take the opposite approach and focus on the software first and then come and start working on hardware next. Uh, so many great academic projects and maker projects creating really neat instruments. And now, if you're interested, you can connect it to air casting and have a ready-made way to basically log your data. You can graph it in real time, map it in real time. You can send the data to aircasting.org or you can send it to your own server. So if you just want to use air casting as a way to collect your field data and map it and graph it and then send the data to your own website, you can do that too. Um, and then I want to talk about a bit about this latest instrument that we're working on. Uh, just a black box now. Nothing too uh, sexy or exciting. Uh, but basically, this is a, a better version of the Shinyi sensor um, that I showed you earlier. It can count smaller m particles, a half a micron in diameter and up. Uh, and I should mention why that's important. These very small particles, uh, between uh, two and a half microns and less, are some of the most dangerous particles because they can get deep inside of our lungs and actually pass through into our bloodstream and impact our health. Uh, one kind of uh, drawback of all of these instruments is that they don't speciate. So they, you don't, we don't know what the particle is, and obviously some particles are worse for your health than others. Some are carcinogenic, some are probably uh, not as much of an issue. Uh, but the small particles are the ones we're most concerned about from a public health perspective. 
Um, and so we designed an enclosure for this to try to eliminate light interference. And also we incorporated a fan. So the Shinyi PPD42NS, the unit you'll be working with, uh, has a resistor that serves as a heating element that basically draws air through the sensor chamber using convection. And so we, di we disabled that on this unit and put a fan in uh, so that we could basically have a, a more consistent airflow uh, regardless of what the temperature was. Because as you can imagine, if you're using that thing outside, depending on the temperature, it's going to work uh, better or worse depending on the temperature. Um, and uh, so I just want to flip real quick and show you my screen. I'm going to show you my uh, some things we've been working on. There we go. Um, so first I wanted to show you what it looks like on the web. Uh, and so you, you'll see here, uh, this is me measuring carbon monoxide in New York City. I'm going from Washington Square Park over to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, and you'll see, you know, uh, if you go along down here, I can trace, I'm getting here, I'm getting my uh, actual part, per, it's actually a raw rating. It says PVB, but it's actually a raw rating that's given out in bits. Uh, and so you can see there is a high point here, uh, and that's basically me stuck behind a truck. And then you see it more red and yellow on either side mm -hmm. of the Brooklyn Bridge, and that's cars and trucks waiting to go across the bridge. Better air quality as I'm passing over the bridge. I should mention that I'm cycling, actually. I'm not driving a car. I'm cycling in this instance. Uh, and so you can see the highest readings were really on either side of the bridge and when I get stuck behind cars. Uh, and so this is what happens when you're air casting. You record a measurement every second. That's recorded as a colored dot that corresponds to you know, the intensity, green, yellow, orange, or red, depending on the intensity of the measurement. Uh, and when you upload the data, you can, it looks like this. And then you can also see it, in addition to your individual session, you can see it as a crowd map, which is basically a heat map of all the readings put together and aggregated. And so this is this now is sound level. So if you look over here, you can see there's lots of different parameter sensors listed, right? So a lot of different people have been uploading information from different instruments, data from different instruments. This one is sound levels before I was showing you CO. And when you click on a square, you get the underlying data. So it says what the average reading was, number of samples, number of contributors. And here you can see it's quieter in the park as you would expect. So Prospect Park's quieter than the surrounding neighborhood of Park Slope. And then you go down here towards the Gowanus, and you start to get these orange ones because the Gowanus has more industrial activity. So that's probably loud trucks and other things like that happening. Uh, let me get out of my screen. Oh, I did want to bump over here for just one second. Um, one of the things we're really focusing on is, as I said earlier, interfacing with schools and community-based organizations. Uh, and so this is a project we did in partnership with the Newtown Creek Alliance, which is a community-based organization uh, representing uh, residents and business owners in North Brooklyn and Western Queens. Uh, and we basically built air quality monitors with the students, and then we created air monitoring plans, went out to the community and took measurements, did an analysis of the measurements, and then reported back to the community and their peers. And this is them doing their final presentation, showing off their air monitors. And you can see right here, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse at all, but this woman holding a black thing. So basically I had them cover them in black construction paper to try to create some sort of light blind. Uh, so it was very interesting. And I think that's one of the things that I would offer to the audience as a design challenge. You'll be building uh, a PPD42NS air casting air monitor, particulate monitor, but it's just going to be the raw electronics. There won't be an enclosure. Uh, we would love to hear from the community in terms of what type of enclosure would work best to eliminate light interference while also maintaining uh, a good and consistent airflow. Um, so if anybody has any ideas on that front, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and with that, I will stop talking and I will hand it off to uh, Ian and Raymond. Mike, who are going to give you uh, a, before you uh, yeah. before you let go, uh, you might check out on the community page just some really interesting work in the. GE garages in Chicago with paper, using paper as an enclosure. Yeah, I definitely will. Would yeah. you say GE garages? And, and no, in our community page. Okay. Yeah. And Michael, I was gonna, I was gonna ask a quick question. With, you know, you described uh, quite a wide variety of of sensors that, you know, from from the very simple kits that we have up to these two, you know, these four and five hundred dollar machines. Does does the website and the data that gets collected is there any sort of error correction or um, you know acknowledgement of the different maybe uh, uh, you know quality of the data from the different devices? Is there any acknowledgement that what you know, that what was collected from one device is different from the other? 
That's a really good question. Uh, so we don't have anything in place. So what we really want to do in the future is basically have software in place that can do network level calibration. Uh, so in other words, your instrument can just read your raw measurements into the system and then at such a time that we can evaluate your instrument, we can basically correct those. Or at such a time as your instrument comes a pass comes past another one, you could basically stop and say, look, your instrument looks more expensive, or your instrument looks like it was calibrated a week ago, why don't we stop, and we're both measuring the same error, and then I'll calibrate my unit based on the readings from your unit. Um, so we're looking forward to basically implementing all sorts of filtering and algorithms to basically improve the quality of the data. Currently, the best solution for you would be to filter your data based on, so there's all sorts of uh, filters uh, when you're looking at the data by date, uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, who's carrying the device, by tags. And so you could filter your data so you're only seeing your data alone. Uh, so if you don't want to see other people on the crowd map or you don't want to see other people's sessions, you can filter and just see your data or other people who you know who you trust. And I forgot to mention one other thing. Uh, so I said health and environmental data. And so we also have uh, you know commercially available devices. This is the Zephyr, uh, Zephyr HXM, and it does heart rate, and it just goes across your chest. Um, and so that's connected. You can connect this to air casting. And then there's another unit. This is around $80. And there's another unit called the Zephyr BioHarness 3. Uh, and this costs around $450, so it's pretty pricey. And we actually developed connectivity with this uh, because of something called the My Air, My Health Challenge. And it was a EPA, uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services, and uh, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences Challenge that said, measure one physiological parameter and one air quality parameter and talk about how they're related. So this unit uh, can do heart rate, heart rate variability, peak acceleration, activity level, breathing rate, um, core temperature, and probably something else I'm forgetting. Uh, but we were looking at the response of heart rate variability, which is the variation in uh, time between heartbeats over time, uh, and how that's impacted by carbon monoxide in particular matters. So that was the bio harness plus the air go. So that's what we're doing with CMU and, and people at NYU also, New York University. Um, so in addition to being able to measure air quality, you can also measure physiology and you can see is there some sort of correspondence between the two. And I think that's really where uh, things are going. It, it, it'll be really, really interesting to see what the, what the correspondence is between these things. So, you know, uh, can I measure my sleep at the same time measuring noise levels? And can I note that in the middle of the night, I'm not actually waking up but my sleep is disturbed. Maybe my heart rate's elevated, or maybe when I wake up in the morning, I measure my cortisol, and I can see that my cortisol levels are higher. So even though I didn't know I had disrupted sleep, I can actually see that through taking measurements. Uh, so uh, combining uh, you know, qualitative observation with quantitative measurement and, and using that to kind of advance uh, planning and advocacy goals. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, switch over. Uh, Raymond and EM? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay. First, first thing is I uh, will introduce myself and Raymond uh, Yap. Uh, uh, my name is Sam Hang. Uh, I'm assistant professor from uh, Manhattan College, and Raymond Yap is a graduate student from uh, Manhattan College. So as you can hear from Michael before, uh, for, for our portion, we're going to show you how to design the uh, PPD42NS uh, Shinji sensor. Um, so let me uh, first begin with uh, the uh, a, a brief uh, slide show that I'm going to uh, show to everybody the, uh, the objective that we plan to design this device. So let me do it right now. Can anybody see this? The uh, uh, the the I guess the uh, PowerPoint here. We saw it for a second. Okay. Um, all right. Yes. The, um, okay. This is the uh, schematic of building this particle uh, device for Shinji PPD42NS. 
Uh, briefly, I'm going to uh, mention this component, and then Raymond's going to help me out to assemble all of these things. If you can looking at it, uh, basically, as Ma Michael mentioned before, the uh, this is the um, the module of the Xin Yi, and we're going to incorporate with the fan right here, the micro fan, and at the same time, we're going to looking at is the um, the temperature sensor and temperature and humidity sensor called uh, DHT22. Ian, is it possible to enlarge your screen a little bit? Oh, sure, sure. I'm going to do that right now. Is that better? Yes, um, a little. Okay. Uh, the uh, well, the uh, the next thing is if you're looking at over here, this is basically the uh, power, the lithium battery. Power, the power that we're going to use, and we have the five volt boosters. Basically, what happens is when you um, you buy the lithium, it's only 3.7 uh, volt, and you can use the booster uh, bo uh, boost up to uh, uh, five volt. Okay, uh, to begin with design with uh, the device, we uh, list uh, the the parts list. These are the physical components that we're going to use. Uh, for example, I'm going to uh, uh, mention briefly. Uh, we have the uh, 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 Arduino Uno uh, right there, and then we have the Bluetooth, the uh, temperature uh, community sensor, the Shinji uh, NS, and the battery and the fan right here. Now, before before we go into more detail, let me just uh, give you a complete outcome at the end of the, uh, the the design. This is what it would looks like on the physical side of the electronic circuit, connect uh, connectivity, everything together. And finally, as you can see it from Michael, uh, previous slide, uh, previous um, previous uh, demonstration that Michael showed with the uh, the Shinji NS right there. This is what the final would looks like. So now let me get back to. Uh, uh, to, uh, to go step by step how to design the, uh, this uh, uh, Shinji uh, NS uh, sensor detector. All right. The uh, hello. Hello. Yes, okay, that's good. Uh, now the first thing is what I'm going to show you right now is, as I mentioned before, if you uh, we I'm going to ask Raymond to show briefly the uh, the voltage booster. Uh, can you show that, Raymond? Yeah, I'm gonna move the camera I'm using right now, so I'm gonna uh, shift to the side here. Okay. Uh, so this is the voltage booster right here. Try, try to uh, move slowly, Raymond. Yeah, I'm trying to get the right. Hold on. This is the voltage booster. I'm gonna see. Okay, to uh, basically uh, to uh, to read how much. Uh, this booster has a, a currently, so what we do is we uh, connect with the, the battery and uh, use the, the voltmeter to, to uh, measure it. Generally, the booster comes with about 4.0 uh, volt to 4.5 volt. So uh, Raymond is going to uh, connect up and uh, try to boost it up to 5 volt. Give me a second. You okay, Raymond? Yeah, I'm having trouble with the camera. Okay, good position on it. Okay. okay, okay, that's that's very good. Yeah. Do you get a lot of noise? We're we're good. We're good. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, that's good. So basically, you connect the ground. 
ground to the center pin, two ground black wires to the center pin, and the V out is on the on the right pin. Let me check. The V out is on the right pin, which goes to the goes to the voltmeter. Try to uh, move slowly, Raymond. Yeah. Okay. Can you uh, just connect that now to the uh, to the voltmeter to show that you can adjust to uh, from uh, the current volt to the five volt? Yes. It's already adjusted to five volts, so I'm gonna oh, okay. hook up the bat I'm gonna hook up the battery which I have somewhere. And I'll display the five volts to show you. There's some soldering required though, because um we did some soldering prior to this and So I'm going to turn on the ball meter. And uh, for those following along, uh, I've yeah. go, I went ahead and switched my screen to uh, share the instruction manual. So as, uh, as Raymond is going and doing it in real time, uh, you can also uh, look at my screen to see the uh, still shot that might be a little more clear. Correct. Thank you, Micah. Um, Ken, I'm right. not seeing that, though. Yeah. I'm seeing. I'm still seeing you. It's it's coming up. Uh, you know, the, the the viewers are seeing the right thing right now. Okay. I see. Well, well, this house is supposed to be connected, so. Okay. So yeah. that that's okay. Can we move on, Raymond? That that should be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to. Uh, to make sure that the uh, voltage booster go up to five volts, so we can connect that later on to the Arduino and uh, other component that we. It has to be the same, uh, the right voltage level. That's why we're using that. Okay. The next thing I'm going to ask Raymond to help me out is the. Uh, can you uh, just show the, to the audience the uh, the the charger? Oh. The charger connect to the switch. That we, we, uh, the other thing is we already assembled this part here uh, because uh, we because of the timing we don't have enough time so we can't assemble ahead of time. So this is the charger with the switch. What allow us to do is basically the device uh, the switch would turn on and then uh, it would be able to charge it um, to uh, to the device. Um, the next thing I'm going to ask Raymond to show is, can you uh, pull up the uh, Shinyi N uh, NS? Um, yes. Okay. So this is the uh, the Shinyi uh, NS, the physical component. So I'm basically right now going through with Raymond to show all the component, and then we're going to put everything together in a minute. And uh, now, as you can see, previous, uh, I guess, as you can see on uh, on uh, on the breadboard, Raymond right now has the booster, uh, the booster on the breadboard, uh, and also I believe Raymond also has the uh, the the charger with the switch on the breadboard. That's what you have right now, Raymond. Yes. Okay. Can you show it to the audience? Just just yeah, just uh, hook it up. Yeah. All all of these schematic, as Michael mentioned before, is on the website uh, of um, Air Casting website. Okay. Yeah. So the next step we we want to show you to do is can Raymond can you bring out the Arduino Uno and connect it on the breadboard? The Arduino the Uno. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to what we do right now is take the Arduino connecting the uh, power the the um, the power, uh, the power line to the Arduino. The uh, the red is the five volt. 
and then we connect to the ground. So uh, it's going to take the uh, power from the lithium bar uh, battery. Um, now you can see it. Uh, this is why we incorporate the switch. Basically, the switch allow us to uh, uh, have flexible of uh, turning on the the power on and off when when you want to use the de device. The uh, next thing is Raymond. Can you uh, 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 can, uh, put the uh, the temperature humidity sensors and the Bluetooth on the breadboard? Yes. Okay, uh, can you show at this point, can you show to the audience uh, so far what we have slowly? Uh, uh, t uh, Ken, is that clear picture? Or? Yeah, okay. we're, we're, we're seeing it real well. Okay, now uh, as you can see it right now, we have the Arduino, the Bluetooth, the uh, temperature humidity sensors, and the booster on the breadboard. The, the next step we want to do is uh, we're going to make a connection uh, for the power uh, to the uh, to the temperature humidity sensors. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to use the red line as for uh, the uh, the power from the breadboard that uh, we connect to the blue to, I mean to the temperature humidity sensors. It's uh, it, hmm? okay. You 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 done, Raymond? Yeah, I I okay. connected the temperature sensor. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, now what I'm going to do next is uh, uh, connecting the uh, the resistors. The resistor. Yeah. Can you put the resistor? The resistor we're going to use is 10k. Um, resistor incorporated with the uh, temperature humidity sensor is because we want to have a better reading. As uh, a uh, signal reading to the, uh, I guess to the microcontroller, and then we can see it from there. Take that signal connected to the app of air casting. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. It's connected. You're done to with the, that. The, okay. Yeah, with the drain. Okay. Now, what we want to do next is um, we're going to do is the uh, connection of the uh, Bluetooth. Can you connect the Bluetooth? Uh, well, yes. first thing is we need to all of these components. Just keep in mind, you always have to uh, uh, supplement uh, the power to these components in order to make things work. So right now, I believe Raymond is connecting the power to the Bluetooth. Now, the funny thing is, as you can see, it is no no cable connect to the uh, microcontroller. All the power is basically from the, the lithium um, ion battery, which is uh, we mentioned earlier is 3.7, 3 uh, about uh, to 2,000 uh, uh, milliamp uh, hour per hour. You done, okay. Raymond? Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Now, can you connect the uh, because uh, now we need to connect the signal, uh, basically the transmitter from uh, the uh, Bluetooth to the uh, uh, Arduino. In other words, we're going to do the uh, uh, the RX and TX pin. The RX uh, and TX is basically uh, for transmitter and receiver from the um, uh, from the Bluetooth to the Arduino, and okay. Arduino to the Bluetooth. You done All with right. that? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, let me see. And uh, I believe the last thing we need to do is now we need to connect the uh, the uh, the Xinyi NS. Yep. Okay. The the Xinyi NS has uh, three pin. Um, two of the pin uh, is the power and the ground, and the other pin is for the signal. Which is for data acquisition, and most of the sensor is usually come with three pin. Uh, 
Okay, it's totally assembled. Except for okay, the uh, everything's done now. Now the yeah. last thing, as as you can see, at the uh, the the fan that is incorporated part of the device. So we're going to uh, connect the fan uh, on the breadboard uh, with the breadboard. The fan is very small. The thing about this fan is this is a very mi uh, micro fan, and um, the, it's very tricky is to uh, solder them with the uh, jumper cable. Uh, can uh, can you move slowly to the camera and then show how how tiny the the uh, the, the the cable fan is? Yeah. I don't know if you can see it. It's very tiny, and the thing is very fragile. And um, the fan take about 3.2 to uh, 3.7 uh, volt, so it fit nicely with the Arduino. The Arduino has one of the pin is 3.3 volt, so that's what Raymond is going to connect to the uh, one of the pin in the Arduino right now. Okay, and I the last thing we need to do is if you're looking at carefully right now the pretty much the electronic uh, uh, design is almost done except we need to uh, supply the, the power which is we need to connect the battery uh, the lithium uh, ion uh, to the breadboard no 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 the, the lithium ion Raymond the oh, battery yeah, yeah. Uh, the battery So the battery would power the whole electronic um, on this uh, particular device. I think it's out of power as far. The um, battery's out of power. It's out of power? Yeah. Oh, I see. You have um, to charge it. Oh, okay. You can use the USB, it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, just leave it like that for now uh, so the viewer can see. If you're looking at it, uh, this is a complete uh, circuit design of an S, and you can see it. The, uh, the the power is from the battery itself. However, if the, uh, the if you ran out the power, you can always use a USB to charge it uh, the, uh, the the device. So uh, as you can see, it uh, currently the blinking light indicate from the Bluetooth is not connected. If you uh, the the microcontroller is already has uh, the program that we already download to the microcontroller, so if we use this uh, like Michael mentioned earlier, if we use the uh, Android uh, uh, phone or, or tablet, uh, turn on the uh, connectivity, the red light would uh, turn into solid light. Can you show that demo quickly, Raymond? Uh, using your phone, using your phone on your tablet. My tablets. I have to get my tablet. Oh. Uh, uh. All right. Hold on. Ian, can you summarize okay. what okay. what the uh, what the device is doing? What capable of doing right now? Well, right now the whole thing that we just show is the electronic designs of the N uh, the NS the Shinji NS is the particle. Uh, the detection that Michael mentioned is that the NS monitor the larger particle from 2.5 or, or larger, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not uh, the uh, the complete prototype. I mean, it's a complete prototype in terms of the electronic. And then what we do is we put in the uh, uh, in the nice case, and uh, you can see it earlier. Michael uh, showed those case. Michael, you still have that case? Can you put it up? Right there, you see it. So inside that particular case, those are all of those electronic. We able to condense it like that. So uh, what we're doing right now is just show electronic uh, perspective side. Thank you, Michael. And uh, and that's how the electronic and uh, circuit uh, design for this. Uh, uh, Shinji NS uh, sensor work, and uh, I hope my uh, I hope uh, Raymond can show quickly just connectivity to show you. We just did about uh, I believe the 10 or 15 minutes, so uh, hopefully that we can connect this and show it to you right now. 
Yeah. Now, for the viewer, you can see it. The light is still blinking. That's not right now. It becomes solid a minute when it's, the connectivity is connect. That's solid. You see now solid. That indicate that it is communicate with the uh, the tablet right now or the Android smartphone. Uh, this conclude uh, this conclude the uh, the section of the electronic designs of uh, the uh, Shinji NS. And if you have any question, you can always contact myself, Michael or Raymond Yap. And I'm going to pass on to uh, Tim to oh, don't, complete don't, out. Yeah. Don't forget about the configuration of Bluetooth. That oh, needs to be yeah. Done too. yeah. Yeah, that, that's uh, actually uh, Raymond is correct. Uh, most of the uh, Bluetooth, you have to do uh, a minor configurations. And uh, if you need help, on those configuration, we actually have a document for that too. So, uh, but generally, uh, everything should be straightforward. So, Tim, you you also to take it from here. Well, let me also okay. say that that we're going to do our best to get documentation on everything that you've seen so far up on the Urban Sensor Hacks Google Plus community. So, if there's anything that you missed watching this or something that went by too quickly. Take a look back there. We're going to get as many slides and photos and everything posted up there as we can. And okay. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, uh, great. It's uh, glad to be part of this. Um, so my name's uh, Tim Dye. I work at an uh, environmental consulting firm in, located in Northern California. And we've been studying air quality for, for over 30 years. And I got really interested in what's happening um, a number of years ago, because I have a backyard weather station, I'm a weatherman by training, and one of the things that I thought of is why can't we have home air quality monitors? And so I started looking around and wondering about that, and that's how I discovered Michael probably three years ago, and then we've been collaborating ever since, and we're working with a bunch of other people on, on these issues as well. Probably one of the key things that that we want to work on is quality. You know, how, you just built a sensor. Well, how good is it? Is it 20% better than the professional grades, or, or worse than the professional grades? Is it? Does it measure anything? And so these are some of the questions that I'm exploring. And what and just what I want to do today is just highlight a couple of things. One is sensing is challenging. Okay, it's one thing to build a sensor right there. When you take it out in the real world and start making measurements, all of a sudden, many other factors come into play. And I'm going to talk just a couple, a little bit about some of those. Um, and I really want to hit on three things. And the first thing I want to talk about are what you're trying to sense. And that's hopefully you can see that um, this right here is a disk that I created. This is um, basically to give you an idea of what these particles look like. Um, this is a normal grain of sand, okay? This would be the size of a really fine grain of sand. The particles we're talking about are even smaller than little grains of sand. In this case, these, these particles are called particulate matter, or PM10, 10, 10 microns in diameter. And these are not the problematic ones because when you inhale the air and these PM10 particles are in there, they get caught in your nose and your throat and we can get rid of those. The, the pesky ones are these ones up here. They're really small PM 2.5 particles. So these are 2.5 uh, microns in size. So very small. And those get deep into your lungs and can actually get into your cardio, cardiovascular system. So the other thing to recognize about what we're sensing, which are little particles, is these these ones right here look all cute, right? They're all round. They're all perfect. In the real world, when you go out there, they're not round and perfect. They're jagged. They have all different shapes. They're different sizes. Some are small. Some are a little bit larger and so forth. Some are coated by water. Others are dry. Um, Stuart, you mentioned earlier about primary and secondary pollutants. Particles are both. Are both. They're emitted. We can think about like a diesel truck. You see the particles coming out of that. But particles can also form in the atmosphere as a result of gases getting together and it can form actually a, a liquid or a somewhat solid particle. So when we're, when we're sensing, we need to think about some of these issues, um, composition, size, and density. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about is just some 
comparisons that we've been doing to investigate how good are some of these sensor systems. So behind me, I have an instrument um, right here. Um, I'll try and do, do my best. Um, I'll give you an idea of what it looks like. Hopefully you can see that there. This is called um, a particulate matter sampler, and it makes hourly measurements of particulate matter. It brings in air right up at the top there. The air flows in, swirls around, and that swirling process called a cyclone basically distributes some of the larger particles, and the smaller particles end up coming down into the instrument right here and then collecting on tape. And they collect on tape, and you collect the particles for an hour, and then there are sensors in there and instruments that then look at how many particles were collected on that particular tape. And that's one of the ways that um, these professional-grade instruments can tell how many particles were in the air. And so around the country, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these, okay? But there's not thousands of them. In many urban areas, there's only, you know, I think, Stuart, you mentioned there were 40 or so. Urban areas may have 10 or 20 or maybe only a couple. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just talk about with some of these particles is the composition of it. So I have some filter tape here. I'm going to hold it up to the camera. And you can see it has different colors. Okay. Some of it's really black. And then some of it is lighter, like that right there, kind of more brownish. And what's interesting is I did some comparisons in my, my garage with this instrument and, and the instrument that you built as well as some other ones and started comparing things. And when you burn something, it creates lots of particles. And it depends on what you're burning. If you're burning more fuel, diesel, kerosene, things like that, that tends to be a lot darker so those were some of the dark specs. If you're burning things that are more organic matter, like plants, um, tobacco, um, wood, that ends up being um, much more like this, this color right here, um, more woody. So these particles have different colors. And so when they go through the sensor, they respond differently as a result of that. So that's one of the things to really um, consider when you're making these measurements. The other thing I wanted to point out, go ahead, was there a question? OK. Um, I'm also evaluating, this, this instrument behind me is about $20,000. OK, and we have a bunch of those, and we use them for our professional studies. But we're also looking at kind of lower cost models. This model right here is. Um, it doesn't use filter tape like the one behind me. Instead, it brings in air, much like the one that people built today, and shines light across that and looks at the scattering of light. Um, and this is about $5,000. But this is actually a pretty good reference instrument. And then, uh, like Michael showed earlier, we've got other, this is a commercial device, Dylos, and we're making comparisons of this as well. So one of the things that I'm doing is running all of these in my garage. And I go into my garage, and I light a little fire. Not a big fire, just a small fire. Create a bunch of particles. And then see how these sensors respond. And it's kind of interesting. And I want to show you just a plot um, that I created here. So I'm going to switch. Um, let's see. Screen share. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, this is a plot. Um, we call it a scatter plot. And these are all the one-minute uh, readings that I made. And along the x-axis is showing the reference uh, particulate matter uh, readings. So this is particulate matter PM 2.5. The units are micrograms per meter cubed. And it ranges from 0 to about 1,000. So you know, for reference here, a clean day is going to be, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10 or so. When we start to get up into the 50 to 100, you're going to really notice a lot of haze. 
if you go overseas to areas of China and India, you're going to be up in the readings of 300 to 500 micrograms per meter cube. So that gives you an idea of, of reference. Along the, the y-axis, I have the Dylos instrument. This was the black one that was about $300. And what's interesting about these three curves, what I want you to do is focus on the brown curve, the, the purple curve, and the black curve. The instrument, I burned different things during all these events. I burned kerosene, I burned wood smoke, and then there was a, our paper really is the purple, and then outdoor uh, brown was wood smoke. What it's showing is that the sensors respond differently based on what the color of the particles is that you're putting through the sensor. So that's a little bit of a challenge when it comes to using some of these low-cost systems is a given reading of, let's say, 15,000 from the dialos could be anywhere from 50 micrograms per meter cube to 100 to as much as 200 micrograms per meter cube. So they respond really differently. Now if I can get back... Okay, good. Um, so I've really been kind of fascinated by how good are these things. And it turns out um, if you compare this one, about $300, to this one that's about $5,000, this guy's actually pretty good. Um, really good at detecting trends. You would know, is the smoke level going up in my house or outside? Is it going up? You don't know the cause of the pollution, but you're going to see these general trends, and you can trust these general trends. Now, there are some things that you need to consider when doing sensing, and particularly particle sensing. One of the things that happens with these small particles right here is um, they absorb water. And when the relative humidities get really high, let's say over 80, 90 percent, all of a sudden these small particles start to swell. And as they get bigger and bigger, they're going to scatter more light. So if you think about a particle moving through a sensing device where you've got light and you're looking at the scattering, the particle moving through there may be one size. You may take the same size and you add water around it when the humidity is really high and you put that through, that's going to give you a different response. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to make this, the particle measurements and temperature and humidity measurements concurrently so that you can consider that. The, the last thing that I wanted to kind of hit on was really the, the quality issue. And I'm kind of the, the, the weather air quality geek, but I really believe that it's important to make quality measurements. We're not going to replace a $20,000 instrument like this guy right here with a $15 sensor we can get some relative indicators. And so the question is, how do you know that's going to be good? How do you know that the readings coming out of that sensor are going to be good? One thing you can do is all of the reference stations that are out there that are running or throughout the U.S. and Canada are reported every hour on the web at a website called airnow.gov. And that information is available. So you can go to that website and you can look at particle concentrations. And so if you live near one of those, you can compare your sensor readings to the reference instruments. So that's one way that you could do it. Another way that you can see is if, if your sensor is performing is to look at other conditions around. You know, what's happening in the environment around you? Um, is there burning going on? Are you burning candles? Are you burning wood smoke? Is someone smoking? Is the humidity going up? How is that changing? And look for these changes over time to begin to, to understand the environment around you. Um, it was actually interesting this past winter when I was running this device right here. I ran it outside, and I could actually, from inside, watch the readings change and get an indication of was there wood smoke in my backyard, wood smoke from residential wood burning. And when I would see the readings go up maybe 8, 10, 9, about 10,000 or so, I knew there was wood smoke in my backyard. And I had just kind of created that correlation by going out and smelling it in the air 
and then looking at the readings and doing that through several days. So that's one of the ways that you can see. Is it reporting decent data in a qualitative sense over time? So those were a couple of the things that I wanted to cover. There's a whole slew of additional information that I have on some of the comparisons that I made um, and some other things that I'll post online after the Hangout. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Tim, excellent. Hey, Michael, I had a question. Um, when you're, com you know, compiling uh, data geographically and it's coming in from different locations, how do you normalize it for these kind of accuracy questions? Uh, that was one of the things that uh, I had mentioned earlier. You know, there, we don't have anything in place currently. Uh, the best thing to do would basically uh, be to filter the map uh, by profile name. So everybody who contributes data to the crowd map uh, and shows up on aircasting.org, that data is associated with a profile name. So if you just view the data uh, from trusted carriers, then that would be the best way to, uh, to see data that, that you trust. Here's an interesting question. So how hard is it if you have either a device you've built yourself or you know, a, a, a lower cost device, you know, can you simply go find one of these reference devices, set your device next to it for an hour, and have them, you know, have it get calibrated? Yeah, I, that's something that we're pursuing. So we actually received a, uh, a a bit of funding from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, it was for a partnership between Habitat Map, Sonoma Technology, Tim's company, and an environmental justice community-based organization called Uprose which is in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and we'll be doing exactly that. Uh, we'll be looking to get access to a DEC monitoring site, and we'll bring our instrument, and we'll locate it next to it, and we'll do co-location calibration. Um, and so we're very much looking forward to that because that's really the next step for us uh, is to basically really, you know, we've built instruments, we've got the software running, now we really have to improve the quality of the measurements and that means everything from improving the design of the instruments, uh, selecting the appropriate sensor, designing an appropriate enclosure, uh, putting in, into place things like uh, co-location calibration on the software level, um, and a whole slew of other things. Um, so we're really excited about working on that and, and addressing some of these quality issues that are, that are very, very important to the work. Well, one of the uh, one of the other things that I would mention just quickly is that we're doing some work for the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Air Now program that I mentioned flows in hourly data. We have a pilot project right now where we're bringing in one minute data from some sensors in a couple of cities and making that information available to sensor developers for exactly this purpose. Could you take your device out? and run it next to a station for a couple hours and then compare the data. So we have a pilot project where we're exploring that very thing. Excellent. Yeah, you know, I just, from, from a geographical sense, I love the fact that we've got these two teams, one, you know, out, you know, a team in Brooklyn and in New York, and out here in the bucolic Sonoma countryside, and working together on these, on these very important issues and making it all very you know, public access, open open source is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, have another, I have another question for Tim and Michael. Uh, if, do, you, do you guys foresee uh, a time when uh, average people, citizens, can contribute their data into the into these larger databases um, in a way that's um, you know in a way that's accepted as quality data? I guess. I, I would I think there is going to be that time because the backyard weather station movement that's been happening for maybe a decade or so I have one that data flows into NOAA you know our National Weather Service and appears on their page wow. so uh, you know I think that day will come we're not there yet but as soon as we hit the kind of quality mark that data is going to be of usefulness to systems like air now and other systems that are out there for alerting people about the air that they're breathing. Well, just just a comment that I want to say. Uh, the uh, I mean I saw Tim showing the uh, uh, the monitor device behind uh, I guess in his office. You can see it the device itself is a huge device and it costs a lot of money. 
The other thing is common citizen would not able to uh, get those de device. Uh, the other uh, and the other thing is not really uh, mobile. It's too large to move around. So one of the things that I'm interested when I work with Michael is uh, I looking at this is a uh, more opportunity for the future because uh, citizen can actually uh, uh, hopefully can uh, buy this device and carry it around and able to monitor the air around them and report it uh, uh, you know to the uh, I guess to the website uh, to the server uh, that would be um, you know this is a good idea to have you know like right currently uh, I believe is uh, there's no small devices to carry around that they do have it but it's a uh, it's a little bit um, expensive for the, for general consumer to afford. So, uh, uh, in a way, I think the uh, the device we design is is uh, quite small and affordable, and hopefully uh, we can make it more accuracy reading in the near future. So just uh, just a com that's just a comment from me. Yeah, it looks like I mean obviously it's uh, we we are in if not the early days the middle early days. Of finding yeah. that crossover between, you know, we, we have these amazing Arduino devices, the microcontrollers, and as the the quality sensors are, are, are more of them are made and they come down in price, are allowing the makers and the hackers to start doing these things and these organizations to start putting together initiatives that help spread the word and start bringing and collating the data together. Obviously, you know we're 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 on the right path, and it is very foreseeable in two years, three years, five years that we'll be able to have a a, a network of sensors all across the country and across the world that can be our early warning systems for environmental problems, the same way we have for weather stations and so many other things right now. So that's you know that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, Stuart, have you got anything else that you want to, uh, to mention before we go? <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, I'm actually, I'm just imagining some kind of situation where someone who didn't own any sensors could subscribe to the data, but I guess, Michael, that's the direction that you're heading. Is that Most true? Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. now you can go to the website and you can look at, see what data was collected. Uh, we're actually now in the process, I showed you this, uh, you know, black instrument, so we've got a, a nicer particulate matter sensor. Uh, smaller particles working on the enclosure uh, go from an Arduino to a custom printed circuit board and from a 3D printed enclosure to an injection molded enclosure and, and produce a large number of these. So we're looking to produce 500 uh, to 1,000 of these and we're going to do a crowdfunding campaign because uh, one of the barriers to participation is simply that people cannot get the instruments. And one of the things that we've been uh, working on this whole time is to create an instrument that can provide quality measurements. Uh, and so we, we've been kind of uh, rushing towards that goal, uh, but not wanting to basically uh, provide anything for sale until we had an instrument that we, prov that, could, we that we could trust. It doesn't need to be perfect, like Tim said. It doesn't need to be, uh, you know, as good as the $20,000 instrument, uh, but if it can at least provide us uh, information regarding trends, then we, then we have some relative information. We could say the air is, air is better here than it is over there, uh, you know, it's better this time of day than during this time of day, um, and then we can go move forward with all the other things, which are which people are really excited about. Which is, uh, well, how do we change behavior? How do we change policy? So, if I know where the air is worse, do I change my commuting route? If I know where the air is worse, do I advocate for marine transportation over truck-based transportation of freight? So, there's a whole number of issues that can be dealt with when we have this information. Uh, and we're certainly dealing with them now, but the power of that information to advance those causes uh, will will really will we'll see magnified over time as as the data becomes uh, you know better spatial and temporal resolution, higher resolution data, uh, and also people being engaged in the process of making the measurements and making the instruments that uh, you know. It's, it, it, there's something that is beyond just the information, but it's the act of participating. The act of participating in making an instrument, the act of participating in, in uh, taking measurements, and then seeing them crowdsourced. So it's not just your measurements, but it's the measurements from your friends, your peers, uh, everything. Uh, you know. So there's something powerful about uh, you know, taking this quantitative data uh, and combining it uh, and also being a practitioner and someone who's actually taking measurements. 
Gosh, I think we're at the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent, Stuart. Um, I think uh, I think we're wrapping this one up. This has been a fascinating and exciting uh, talk today, and you know, just getting the chance to see, you know, what what the very simplest to the most complex uh, uh, sensors that are available in this sphere, and how much energy and excitement there is behind getting these in people's hands and starting to really do something powerful with them. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we had a very lively uh, uh, live viewership today. It was, it's been one of our strongest so far, and that's fantastic. Um, we have one more regular Urban Sensor Hack uh, Hangout that's going to happen this Thursday, same bat time, uh, uh, 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 uh, East Coast. That'll be with uh, Thomas Diaz, Thomas Diaz uh, of Smart Citizen, the largest crowd-sourced sensor platform and community on Earth. Uh, he'll be in to talk with us. Uh, Mike Sinise will be back to host that one. And then I believe, Stuart, we had a conversation that uh, our grand finale where the uh, Urban Sensor, sensor Hack teams that all uh, got their special kits will be showing off what they've been building It'll be on Friday the 18th, probably uh, noon central time, so 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Is that right? That's right. That's yeah. right. And it will be live from the uh, GE garages in Chicago. Excellent. So everybody stay tuned for this Thursday for our last regular sensor hack, and definitely tune in for that grand finale where we can see some of the exciting things that these teams have been building. Um, Stuart, any last words for today? No, this is terrific. This is really interesting. Excellent. Well, everybody, thank you so much for participating. And everybody who viewed us or will view us over the next couple of weeks, I hope you're getting as much out of it as we are. This has been fascinating. So uh, from uh, Make Headquarters up here in Sebastopol, I'm Ken Denmead, Editorial Director with Make. Uh, thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. So long. Bye now. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Bye-bye.